reading through the Bible in one year, August 12th, 1 Samuel chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, Jeremiah 40, and Psalms 15 through 16. Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is lifted up by the Lord. My mouth boasts over my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no holy, rather there is no one holy like Yahweh. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not boast so proudly, or let arrogant words come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and actions are weighed by him. The bows of the warrior are broken, but the feeble are clothed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are starving hunger no more. The woman who is childless gives birth to seven, but the woman with many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and gives life. He hands, rather, he sends some down to Sheol, and others he raises up. The Lord brings poverty and gives wealth. He humbles and exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the trash heap. He seats them with the noblemen and gives them a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are Yahweh's. He has set the world on them. He guards the steps of his faithful ones, but the wicked perish in distress, rather in darkness. For a person does not prevail by his own strength. Those who oppose Yahweh will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king. He will lift up the horn of his anointed. Elkanah went home to Ramah, But the boys served the Lord in the presence of the priest, Eli. Eli's sons were wicked men. They did not respect the Lord or the priest's share uh, of the sacrifices of the people, or from the people. When anyone offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged meat fork while the meat was boiling and plunge it into the container, kettle, cauldron, or cooking pot, and the priest would claim for himself whatever the meat fork brought up. That's how it's supposed to work. This is the way they treated all the Israelites who came there to Shiloh. Even before... Lost my spot. There we go. Even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the one who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast, because he won't accept boiled meat from any of you, only raw. If that person said to him, well, the fat must be burned first, then you can take whatever you want for yourself. Well, then the servant would reply, no, I insist that you hand it over right now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. So the servant's sin was very severe in the presence of the Lord, because the men treated the Lord's offering with contempt. Samuel uh, served in the Lord's presence. This mere boy was dressed in the uh, linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife. May Yahweh give you children by this woman in the place of the one she has given to Yahweh. Then uh, they would go home. The Lord paid attention to to Hannah's need. And she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now, Eli was very old. He heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance to uh, to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why are you doing these things? I have heard about your evil actions from all these people. No, my sons. The news I hear about, or sorry, the news I hear of the Lord's people spreading is not good. If one person sins against another, God can intercede for him. There we go. But if a person sins against Yahweh, well, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to their father, 
since the Lord intended to kill them. By contrast, the boy Samuel grew up in stature and favor with the Lord and with the people. Listen, um, I forget what the verse is. Um, at the end of like Luke chapter 2, the same thing is said about Jesus, that he grew in stature and favor among the people. Verse 27, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. I didn't reveal myself to your forefathers' family when they were in Egypt and belonged to, sorry, starting over. Didn't I reveal myself to your forefathers' family when they were in Egypt and belonged to Pharaoh's family or Pharaoh's palace? Out of all the tribes of Israel, I chose your house to be my priests and to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense and wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your forefathers' family all the Israelite food offerings. Why then do all of you despise my sacrifices and offerings that I require at the place of worship? You have honored your sons more than me by making yourselves fat with the best part of all the offerings of my people Israel. Therefore, this is the declaration of the Lord, the God of Israel. I did say that your family and your forefathers' family would walk before me forever. But now, this is the Lord's declaration. No longer. For those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disgraced. Look, the days are coming when I will cut, oh, cut off your strength and the strength of your forefathers' family, so that none in your family will reach old age. You will see distress in the place of worship, in spite of all, the, uh, all that is good in Israel. Like I'm trying to make sure we don't lose any notes here. There we go. Any man from your family I do not cut off from my altar will bring grief and sadness to you. All your descendants will die violently. This will be the sign that will come to you concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Both of them will die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest for myself, and he will do whatever is in my heart and mind. I will establish a long dynasty for him and he will walk before my anointed one for all time. Anyone who is left in your family will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread, and he will say, Please appoint me to, pr to some priestly office so that I can have a piece of bread to eat. Let's move on to Romans chapter 2 now. Therefore, Paul now continues, Every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things, yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life, to whom... Uh, I lost my spot. Uh, eternal life to those who, by persisting in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every, for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew, this would have been shocking to the Jews to hear, and also to the Greek, the Gentiles. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew, and also to the Greek. 
For there is no favoritism with God. For all who sin without the law will also perish without the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So, when Gentiles, who do not by nature have the law, this is again the law of God, they don't have it because they weren't taught it as children, uh, do what the law demands, well, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the written law of God. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Remember, we read this in, in Jeremiah. Their consciences uh, confirm this. Their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them. On the day when God judges, what people have kept secret according to my gospel, my good news through Christ Jesus. Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God about your Jewishness and, you know, all of those things, and know his will, and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law. And if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, and a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, and a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, so you then, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal, do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do, uh, do you dishonor God by breaking this law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. That's, that's the sign that you are under the law, right? But if you are a lawbreaker, well, your circumcision has become worthless. It's become uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised man, one who does not bear these marks, keeps the law's requirements, he's restating what he said before, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision because he's a keeper of the law, whereas you who have the circumcision are not? A man who is physically uncircumcised, but who keeps the law, will judge you, who are a lawbreaker, in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. A person is not a Jew who is merely one outwardly. And true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is of the heart, by the Spirit not the letter. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. And there's all the notes. Let's go on to Jeremiah 40 now. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guards, released him at Ramah. When he found him, he was bound in chains with all the exiles of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. The captain of the guards took Jeremiah and said to him, Yahweh, your God, decreed this disaster on this place. And Yahweh has fulfilled it. He has done just what he decreed. Because you, uh, you people have sinned against Yahweh and have not obeyed him, this thing has happened. This is now someone else telling the people the exact same thing. This is the captain of the guards. This guy is a Gentile telling the people the same thing that Jeremiah has already said. Now, pay attention. Today I am setting you free from the chains that were on your hands. If it pleases you to come with me to Babylon, well, come and I will take care of you. But if it seems wrong to you to come, to, uh, to come with me to Babylon, well, go no farther. Look, the whole land is in front of you. Wherever it seems good and right for you to go, go there. When Jeremiah had uh, not yet turned to go, Nebuzaradan said to him, Return to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has appointed over the cities of Judah, and stay with him among the people, or go wherever it seems right for you to go. 
So the captain of the guards gave him a ration and a gift and released him. Jeremiah therefore went to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, at Mizpah, and he stayed with him among the people who remained in the land. Now why did he go to Mizpah? Well, Jerusalem has been destroyed. There's nothing to reign over. So he set him, he destroyed the capital city of not only all Israel, as it was at, the, at one time, but of Judah specifically. He destroyed the capital city and set up a new capital city in the area. This is Nebuchadnezzar's command to do this. Um, and put over them Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, at Mizpah, a place that had not been a capital city to this point. Now, all the commanders of the armies that were in the uh, countryside, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, over the land. He had been put in charge of the men, women, and children from among the poorest of the land who had not been deported to Babylon. So they all came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. The commanders included Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, Johanan, and Jonathan, the sons of Kareath, Sareah, the son of Tanhumeth, and the sons of Eph, uh, Ephi, the, ne the Netophathite, and uh, Jezaniah, son of the Maacathite, they and their men. Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, swore an oath to them and their men, assuring them, Don't be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it will go well with you. As for me, I am going to live in Mizpah to represent you before the Chaldeans who come to us. As for you, gather wine, summer fruit, uh, and oil, and place them in your storage jars, and live in the cities you have captured. When all the Judeans in Moab, and among the Ammonites, and in Edom, and in all the other lands also heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah, and had appointed Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, over them. Then they all returned from their places with, uh, that they had been banished, and came to the land of Judah, to Gedaliah at Mizpah, and harvested a great amount of wine and summer fruit. Meanwhile, Johanan, son of Korea, and all the commanders of the armies in the countryside came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and warned him, Don't you realize that Baalus, king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to kill you? But Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, would not believe them. Then Johanan, son of Korea, there we go, I'm going to make sure that we don't lose any uh, notes here. There's uh, quite a bit and a Pretty interesting map. So then Johanan, son of Korea, suggested to Gedaliah in private at Mizpah, let me go and kill Ishmael, son of Neth uh, Neth Nethaniah. No one will know of it. And why should he kill you and allow all of Judah that has gathered around you to scatter and the remnant of Judah to perish? But Gedaliah, a son of Ahikam, responded to Johanan, son of Korea, Don't do that. What you're saying about Ishmael is a lie. Yep, we'll see how that goes. Let's move on to Psalms 15 through 16 now. Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? The one who lives blamelessly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, who does not harm his friend or discredit his neighbor, who despises the one rejected by the Lord, but honors uh, those who fear the Lord, who keeps his word whatever the cost, who does not lend his silver at interest or take a bribe against the innocent. The one who does these things will never be shaken. Psalm 16. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood and will not speak their names with my lips. Yahweh, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. 
You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless Yahweh who counsels me, even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I will always uh, let Yahweh guide me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. And my body also rests securely, for you will not abandon me to Sheol. You did not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me in your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. All right, that is all for today. Uh, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.